Hey, Talking Cars fans. We're going to be doing a live episode of our podcast at the 2018 New York Auto Show on Thursday, March 29th, and we want you to be there. Just send us an email to talkingcars@consumer.org by Tuesday, March 27th, and let us know if you can make it. You'll be able to ask questions of our experts, and you'll also get early access to the show floor before the general public. CR is going to take care of the tickets. All you got to do is get yourself to New York City. Tickets are on a first-come, first-served basis, so please let us know if you can make it and email us now. We hope to see you at the show. On today's episode, we discuss autonomous vehicle safety, Ford's recent announcement about standard safety features on its upcoming vehicles, the results of our Buick Regal and Kia Stinger road test, and answer viewer questions, next on Talking Cars. Welcome back to another episode. I'm John Linko. I'm Mike Quincy. And I'm Mike Monticello. And first off, want to let everyone know why we're in the, uh, the B studio today, because it's spring. You know, we're wearing some, some yeah, it's It snowing. is spring, but it's not. It's snowing 5 to 12 inches today. And, um, and John has a short sleeve shirt. On. It's spring, for goodness sake, so I'm wearing that. And so we drove in in flurries, just to make sure that we got this episode done. So happy spring to everyone. Don't listen to the Connecticut Groundhog, because he's a total liar, saying that, you know, spring was going to be early. Also, other news... Yesterday or Monday was our fifth anniversary of Talking Cars. So we really, really, really want to thank everyone who's stayed with us, who's given us questions, who comes back each week, you know, now that we're weekly particularly, you know, because it was you asking about, you know, why, why don't we have it on a regular schedule of weekly? That's why we're doing this now. So thanks very much. Here's to another five years, right? And sure. love the questions and comments. Most of them. Yeah, most of them. You know, as, as, as uh, you know, the three hosts, generally, you know, we're missing Jen, but, you know, we, we're really having a good time, and we really like the show. We really like the viewers sending us information and, and questions. And we're all wearing blue. That's for, some true. <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. That's true. It's birthday blue. <laughs> anyway, enough uh, shenanigans. Uh, the first <laughs> bit of news that we're going to talk about, very serious topic. Uh, recently, a, uh, an Uber vehicle, an Uber uh, autonomous vehicle, was being tested in Arizona, and there's a lot of them going on in, in the, the desert southwest. And it struck and killed a pedestrian. And, you know, it's the first time that someone has been injured or killed by a uh, autonomous vehicle in testing. And, you know, Mike, what were the, some of the circumstances that were, that were surrounding this? Because it is a very, right. very serious topic. So it was, it was an Uber SUV. You know, they're getting working on their self-driving uh, program. And uh, it struck a pedestrian uh, at night in Arizona. Who was outside of a who was walking outside of a crosswalk? Mm -hmm. So there were some extenuating circumstances with this with this incident, and you know uh, Uber has since uh, suspended their um, their testing program for now. Uh, there's a federal investigation going on, and so we don't know all the specifics of this incident. But what we do know is this is proof that these systems, you know, the the self the promise of one of the promise of the self driving car is that there's going to be no more fatalities, no more major crashes. Right. They're going to take the 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 human the, element the, out of it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And this, this shows that they're not there yet. And the reality is they're a long ways from there. Uh, you know, what we advocate here is proceed with caution. Mm -hmm. You know, these systems are, you know, a lot of people say they're somewhere like ninety five to ninety nine percent of these systems, you know, they, they can get to where they need to be. But that leaves like one to 5%. And it's that last percentage that is so hard to get right because there's, there's high level decisions that humans make in a car. And certainly we're fallible, no question about that. But there's decisions you need to make. Uh, you know, maybe you hear a siren somewhere, you don't know where it's coming from. How is this self-driving car gonna figure out where it's coming from and where to move? There's right, a right, cop right. directing traffic. How, do, how does the self-driving car know where what to do when that cop is directing traffic well, well you know on that topic i was gonna bring up like the three of us are cyclists so not only do we drive but we spend a lot of time actually interacting with cars in a non-traditional way you know not on the road but mm -hmm. not car to car you know and mike can you touch on some of that like when you're biking like, what what are some of those types of things that you do as far as the non-traditional ways of interacting and that you know that you're not a car with another self-driving car that would be looking at you. Right. Well, <clears throat> with, with cars with a, with a fairly aggressive, like, lane-keeping assist, cars coming, if you're riding on the side of the road and cars coming upon you, the, <clears throat> the driver of the car is most likely going to kind of swerve to their left a bit to get around you. Right. But then give you the, the, the three feet 
Yeah, the, but, but then the law. system is going to read that, oh my gosh, you're going out of the lane, and some systems like, that we've like all experienced, the lane-keeping assist, the lane lane keeping assist, assist is pretty yeah. aggressive right. and pulls you back right. into the lane. Almost hitting the cyclist, which was the thing you were trying not to do. Exactly. Right. right, right, right. So, you know, as, as we've seen either with, with this Uber example or just the self-driving technologies that we experience in our, in our test cars, you know, the, it's, it's, not, it's not foolproof. I mean, this is, it's not working 100% of the time. It's not... It's not it, it, it's not overtaking a good human judgment sometimes. You know, I, I think a, a big takeaway is that, you know, there's a lot going on right now law-wise. You know, the, the governor of Arizona actually on March 1 uh, um, issued an executive order to clarify that self-driving vehicles don't need to operate with a human driver right. as a backup. That may change, you know, after this incident. Um, there's two proposals in Congress going through right now that would eliminate some safety, uh, you know, have a federal law for, for autonomous vehicles, but it may dial back some of the safety rules right, that right. they have to follow. You know, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue, and we're going to have a lot on consumerreports.org about this. Um, it's in the in effort of time we want to, you know, move on. Yeah. But, you know, it is a, it's a big thing. And like you were saying, it's easy to get to 95%. It's that last 4% that's like going up Mount Everest. And this mm -hmm. is a, the first indication that, you know, there's, there's still a lot of fine-tuning or even macro tuning that has to go on. And maybe we should, it should be more a matter of, you know, in, instead of Congress trying to get, uh, uh, get these cars onto the market sooner, it should be more about let's focus on making sure everyone is making them safe. Yeah, let, literally put a brake on some yeah. of it and slow down. Get, yeah. get, it, right, all, get it right before you put it on sale. We're all for right. technology and development of these, of these cars, but, but safety is the Safety's number paramount. one thing. Safety is yeah. paramount. Um, on the topic of safety, Ford has announced uh, that they're going to have a system called a Copilot 360, and it's going to be standard on most Ford vehicles by 2020. Mike, can you give us a little bit of information on this? It's, it's a pretty interesting advancement for a manufacturer that up to now actually was lagging uh, on the safety front compared to some of its competitors. Sure, I mean, you gotta give, you gotta give Ford credit for taking the initiative right now, I think, that uh, you know, they're, they're, they're joining uh, some of the other companies like Toyota and Volvo, uh, nearly all their models have Ford collision warning and automatic emergency braking standard. Right. Consumer Reports gives extra points when we're testing these cars for having this, this equipment standard or, or available on almost every trim line. And acro right, across the line. Right, right. And, and so you know, Ford is, is kind of <clears throat> jump, maybe jumping ahead of the game by saying, all right, we're committed to this, we think it's good, the data shows that it's, uh, it's improving uh, automotive and traffic safety. So, um, I mean, that, that's, I, I, overall, I think that that's good news. <clears throat> you might beg the question, what took you so long? Sure. <laughs> but at least good. they're going in the right direction. You know, it, it's, it's something, it really is something that I, I was looking at. It includes blind spot warning. It'll include lane keeping assist, including automatic high beam headlights. Not, not as important in our mind and our view. Although they're pretty those, cool. When they the work. headlights, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. no, the, the, yeah. The, the automatic high beam headlights are really they're cool, awesome, and it makes you because there might be a time where you actually, uh, you know, you turn them off because the car is coming towards you. Right. You might actually forget to turn them back on. Exactly, and, and these and, systems and, are getting <clears throat> really good to the point I, I keep thinking, okay, it's not going to turn it off. It's not going to turn it off, and then it turns it off, and and then you get into a test car that doesn't have it. Yeah, and, yeah. I'm like, and you why think, do I have? Why to aren't the, why the high beams popping this? on by yeah. themselves? You know, <laughs> did, did Ford need to do this, Mike? You know, uh, here, here's the question. You know. what because I, you know, in, in some ways they're trailing Toyota and Honda, you right. know, and, and Toyota, Honda, uh, Volvo, and Mercedes. Mercedes, um, these are the ones that have a lot of, you know, A, B standard on most of their vehicles, or in some cases, all of their vehicles. Um, I think they needed to, and by doing it in 2020 instead of the, you know, that this this agreement by 2022, right, between number most of, of the manufacturers right. are going to have automatic emergency braking standard on all or most of their vehicles by that time. Ford is saying, you know, we're going to do it ahead of time. Uh, consumers are asking for these these safety systems. Yep. yep. And so they're going to give it to them. And uh, they're even making them optional or available on, you know, some of their, um, you know, their, their bigger, bigger rigs and stuff like that. So that's a key thing, because I'm thinking back to Talking Cars 136. Everyone should, you know, go back to YouTube or to the podcast, look this up, because it's a good episode about safety. And Were you in it? <laughs> I, 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 I was on vacation. I was probably in Florida. Oh, okay. But you were on it, oh. and you were talking with Jen and Jake, and <laughs> this is the key thing I was pulling out of it, is that the vice chairman of the National Automotive Dealers Association, NADA, his name's Wesley Lutz, said at a conference that Jen and Jake were at that, People are coming into dealerships and asking for fuel economy and safety features. So right. not as is, is it the whole like, oh, these are expensive and people aren't asking for them and we want to just give them touchscreens and giant sunroofs. No, people are asking for these features. So there's a demand for it. So no longer is there an excuse <clears throat> to not have it 
on there. And even Jim Farley said that. He said right. drivers tell us they're still stress they're they're still stressed about getting into a potential accident. He's Ford's president of global markets. They, yeah, they may not understand what all the systems do and all the and you know what we were talking about was we were sort of making fun of all the different system names on that show. Right. But uh, so they may not understand all of that, but they uh, definitely know they want safety systems and that's great. And when, yeah. when you drive these cars, you you don't want to drive other cars without them. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it's, can you imagine getting a car without Anti-lock brakes now. Right. No. Right. Like stability <laughs> control. You know, exactly. which went to the same thing. Stability track and all track and track track and, mm -hmm. you know, stay on the road. You know, yeah, there were all kinds of marketing names. And now you just know it as electronic stability control. And now it's standard. And, and a, 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 lot, a lot of research, just on your point, you know, what motivates people to buy cars and, you know, technology, style, price, fuel economy. But safety is like almost always in the top five. Well, you know, so you, you hit you, this, this segment is, is moving along really well because you hit on one element of two cars that just completed testing, style, but also safety and technology. Mm -hmm. We just finished the road test of the Buick Regal and the Kia Stinger. And I want to I wanna toss back and forth to you guys about kind of what we, what we found with them, you know, because they're, they're shapely cars. They're both four-door, mm -hmm. hatchbacks, sportbacks, whatever you want, you know, liftbacks, whatever tech terminology you want to use. Um, upscale or, uh, uh, let's see, luxury, compact, sedan. Oh, it's getting yeah, pretty thick here. Yeah, 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 yeah. BMW 3 Series, Audi, yeah, Audi A4, Mercedes, Mercedes C-Class, right, right, that, right. that type of competitor so, car. So can, you know, can a Buick and a Kia compete with well, the likes right. of yeah. those guys. That's right, actually, so what about the Buick, true. Mike? I mean, the Buick's the first one. I'm actually, I took that home last night and uh, I had driven it when we first got it to mm -hmm. Boston. Like the car, found some some faults with it, but you know, what what do we say about it and what what'd we find? Uh, overall, I, I think that the, the redesigned Regal, it kind of lost a little bit of its handling edge. I think the last model, Regal, was one of those um, really, those cars that flew under the radar, kind of an unsung hero. You, people had no idea how good the last yeah, Regal was. Surprisingly good. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so this model, not quite as engaging as the last one but i mean generally pretty comfortable pretty quiet pretty easy controls um not, not as sporty as the stinger which we'll get to right but, or the but, previous generation regal which was based on a european exactly uh, uh the um one of the uh, opals yep. yeah, right but but overall i i think the regal is is a nice car to live with as long as you're not thinking uh a4 or three series because it because it really can't run with one of those right right yeah it, it it's um you know, it's a powerful engine. It's all-wheel drive, you know, so again, ha the, the, the chop the, or the equipment to play in that category. Um, it runs on premium. Mileage wasn't great, you know, and uh, you, you have to go to consumerreports.org to get some of that information. Oh, that's a tease. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but yeah, not as sporty, but a great cruiser on the right. highway. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the things, interior, not as premium as those competitors, mm -hmm. you know, and our test car was 40 grand, uh, you know, 39 and change, whatever. I in that level, it was very nice. But it looks like an upscale mountain. But it wasn't that nice. Right. I, I got to be honest. Right. With you. I fell asleep as soon as you said Buick Regal. I was like, oh. <laughs> um, no stereotypes. So, no, but seriously, here's the thing: is that is it? You know, you talk, you look at the numbers, and uh, you know the Regal actually came out a lot higher than the Stinger. Mm -hmm. But if it were me, I'd be driving the Stinger. So tell because, us about because, the Stinger. But quickly on the Regal, the reason why not the Regal is just the engine doesn't sound uh, any, like anything special. The interior is pretty boring looking. The car is super quiet though. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. You, but there's just a nice highway just, cruiser. There's right. just very little that gets you excited about that car. Whereas <laughs> the Stinger, just looking at it is exciting. Right. Okay. And here's the difference: the Stinger is based on a rear-wheel drive platform. Okay. The the, yeah. the 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 Regal is not. It's based on a front-wheel drive platform. So the Stinger, even in all-wheel drive like our test car, has some rear-wheel drive tendencies. Meaning when you're you know out on our test track, right. you can get the rear to slide around a bit. You're mm -hmm. not going to get that with mm -hmm. with the Regal. Not not that that's the point to buy the car, but the point right. is. The, the steering Handling is, chops the steering, are there. It, it ha, it's more eager to, you know, uh, attack corners. Mm -hmm. It feels sportier when you drive it. It's actually slower yeah. than the Regal. Right. Uh, but it somehow feels faster, and the engine sounds better. Uh, the interior is far sportier looking, even though, you know, it's not necessarily uh, a grade higher in terms right. of its yeah. materials. But it's just a more fun car to drive. Bot Period. Right. And if you get the V6 version, with yes. the, the twin, the See, I, turbo, I was the turbo say, V6. We, we were, we were, we got a little spoiled because we got to borrow uh, the GT2 version, right. yeah. uh, which, which we have a video of. And it is th that car. I would buy that car. It's so fun mm -hmm. to drive. Yep. Now we, we got the two liter turbo because that is the car that, you know, Kia feels most people were buying. We yeah, try, to, we try to buy the mainstream version. car. Yes. But man, that V6 Turbo is good. I mean, it sounds great, so fast. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say this, there's one thing, you know, and this is, this is something that, that's from our tech report and it's, you know, gonna, it's online. 
there's no reason that the car should be that stiff in the name oh, the of ride. handling, yeah. the, the ride. You know, you can have a car that has great handling mm -hmm. and it doesn't beat you up. You can do it no, better. Yes, it's People not a 911 GT3 RS. Okay, no one expects that to be the car. BMW, you, you know, Audi do it better. No they question do it better. about it. Right. You know, but, so, but, that, that's, so it's a first generation it is an improvement. I would put I up would with it. Honestly, not, yeah, I was going to say, would you not, a, not a deal breaker yeah, for me. Not for I, me I'd, st yeah. I'd still go with this, with the, with the Stinger. And, and it's one of those cars where people say, that's a Kia? Yeah. yeah. Said, no, really. Oh, I mean, I've my, had that happen several times. And my neighbor came out of his house when I brought it home with this and took pictures and, <laughs> and sent them to his, to his college age uh, son. Yep. And said, Check out this new Stinger. I mean, they probably think it's a it's, Porsche Stinger. No, actually, it's a key. It's a cool looking car. I think it's a little J.C. Whitney catalog with a couple of the add-on pieces that look a little like, uh, take dial it back a notch. It could still look really cool. It definitely stands out from the Buick. even stands out from the new Audi A5 Sportback. Oh, I yeah. think the Audi A5 is a little plain. I, I would... I would like to see how that rides and compares with the Stinger if I was putting down my, yeah. my forty to $45,000 or yeah. so. Um, so we're going to move to another segment. We're going to move to questions now. We've got some oh. really good ones, uh, particularly one for these two guys here to talk <laughs> about. Uh, the first one, we have a Camry Fusion question. I got to say, it drives me nuts when you guys recommend cars based on opinion of what CR data says. So, you know, recent episode talked about what, you know, people recommend. I, I, I went to the data. Uh oh. We always go to the Let data. You, he's, a, he's a data guy. <laughs> Let me tell you the overall score, Camry's higher than the Fusion four cylinder SE. The road test score, the Camry's higher. The Camry has better NHTSA crash test scores. The Camry has better owner satisfaction rating from owners uh, you know, who answer our surveys. Camry's far more fuel efficient, quicker, has better seat comfort, controls, and fit and finish. Ford has a better ride, better headlights, better handling. But, like we were talking about before, sometimes we have a personal feeling right. of a car that's you know, not gonna match up exactly with the numbers. Well, Kia yeah. Stinger and right. Regal. Right, right, that's an example. Like, you know, the, the Regal actually is scores higher than the Stinger, but you and I, given the choice, especially because the prices are so similar, we would go with the Stinger. And I think what people have to realize uh, is that it's called a road test score, but it's not just all on-road data. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, we, we, part of that, part of the scoring is how easy, you know, access, cargo room, controls, fit and finish, things that don't have to do with the driving of the car. But ultimately, sometimes, you know, you're going to choose the car that you actually enjoy driving more. It, it could score higher and still not be as good to drive, in some people's right. opinions, as another car. So, but, but the other thing is, if you look at our ratings, you can actually, you know, look at the, the category and look at all the different categories that we have in there, uh, you know, different sections, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's acceleration and, and handling and even cargo, Fuel economy, cargo. Sure. And you can then pick and choose. OK, well, th these are the points that are important to me. Right. right. So I care about this, this and this. And look where those say top three, four, five cars in that in the category score. And then you can kind of choose your car from there. Right. Well, you know, I mean, the scoring, Mike, is is everything's compared apples to apples and within categories so that it's even. But again, there's there's personal feelings about vehicles oh, yeah. as well. I, I think it, it. But not in our ratings. I, I'm, right. I'm, I, I would bet that a lot of people that watch Talking Cars would love to be a fly on the wall when we have ratings meetings mm -hmm. because the numbers are what the numbers are. But we that doesn't mean that's the one we'd buy necessarily. There are times that, that I've been on the podcast where we're, you know, we're comparing car A to car B. And sometimes I'm gonna err toward the side of reliability. You know, yes, the, the Toyota RAV4 is not a sophisticated, smooth, quiet SUV, but man, the reliability is pretty good. Right. And there are times that that's what's most important to me. Yeah, if you're um, buying it for the long run, you might go with the reliability. And sometimes, honestly, it's style. We like the way certain cars look. We, well, you know, and, you know and, and that, but, but, but that's that's how people think. I mean, we have we have millions of subscribers. We send out surveys. Mm -hmm. We ask people about owner satisfaction. We ask people about reliability and all this other stuff. So we have data on really, really low rated cars. Why? Because our subscribers buy them. Right, right, right. It, well, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. People don't just you know go in there and make it a pure analytical decision. Exactly. There's a lot of emotion in it. So yeah. that's gonna that that kind of giving into it. Analytical gives us our next question. Mm -hmm. Hey, CR, I'm considering a compact crossover, keeping my 2008 Saturn Aura 3.5 V6, but I want something that rides higher and smoother over Michigan potholes and in bad weather. Torn between the 2018 GMC Terrain and the Hyundai Tucson. I've seen the Tucson has superior crash test results from the Terrain. Mike, I've got some opinions on this, but you know, give me a couple thoughts. You know, if you want something like the Terrain, I'd go with the Chevy Equinox, mm -hmm. which is a, a better vehicle uh, we found in our testing for less money, and so you're you're getting more vehicle for the money. But even then, I would say you know 
skip uh, probably that as well because it's not one of the higher scoring uh, cars in the category. Right. I would go with, you know, like a Subaru Forester, Toyota RAV4, Honda CRV, or my choice, Mazda CX-5, because I love the way it drives. So, I mean, that's what I would go with. You know, know? And, and, get the, and get the 17s like we did on our car. Right, 17-inch uh, wheels. 17, I'm sorry, yeah, 17-inch <laughs> wheels, because that's going to help the ride comfort. You don't right. want 18s or 19s or anything like that, especially, you know, he's talking about, he or she's talking about uh, potholes in Michigan. Right. Go with, the, go with the smaller wheels and tires. Well, there's a new Subaru Forester getting introduced, so you could probably get a good deal on one of the existing ones. Mm-hmm. So for that one, Mike, what would you choose? Uh, you know, Mike almost kind of took took the words out of my mouth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. We're thinking that's like, why, again. That's uh, why I go <laughs> first. <laughs> yes. That's why I go first. Well, so, I mean, so. <laughs> Foreshadowing. I, I had a couple thoughts. If you're looking at the Tucson, really, um, there's a new engine coming out because the two engines in our test, one was a little quicker, but right. they were both kind of dogs. There's a 2.4 liter four cylinder getting introduced this year. Uh, crash test is a concern if you're really focusing on the terrain because it's a brand new vehicle right. and the NHTSA scores for the Tucson outscore the terrain. So right. you're talking about an older vehicle getting better crash test scores. A- again, like Mike Mike said, th- neither one of them are, are, are stellar in the category. There are better options. CRV, RAV4, CX-5. Yeah, the, kind of the way that I, that I split it up is, is if you want a quiet, comfortable ride, I would go for the Forester. If fuel economy is number one in our priority list, I would go for the RAV4 hybrid. And if it's fun to drive, it's CX-5. Six. So, I mean, I'm taking basically your choices and just, you know, refining them. Just My to awesome so, choices. Yeah, awesome choices. Okay, egos. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> love fest is going on. La- uh, third question, I'd like to buy a used German vehicle. Uh, danger. <laughs> Considering a 2008 to 11 Mercedes-Benz E-Class, a 2014 Audi SQ5, the sporty one, 2013-15 Audi S4 or A4, 2011 to 13 BMW X6. Here's where it gets a little tricky. I intend on keeping as long as humanly possible, 15 to 20 years. I do appreciate wanting to have a vintage car. Good luck with that. I am not interested in additional <laughs> costs of certified pre-owned CPO or patronizing a an OEM. He means a dealer. And do not like wasting money. Should I look elsewhere? Yeah. Wow. Um, That's a tall well, order. I mean, look, probably should look elsewhere. But at the same time, uh, you, you know, so first of all, we don't have data. We don't have reliability data on all these vehicles in terms right. of like we don't have it on a BMW X6. We don't have it on an Audi SQ5. We don't have it on an Audi S4. But we have corresponding, we have data on Audi Q5. We right. have the data A4's. on Audi A4. And the BMW X5. Which and is we have the X5. Very, yeah. So of these choices, because I like to first deal with, you know, uh, their question. You'd, you'd go with the Mercedes E-Class because yeah. of all of those cars, it's the only one that reliability-wise we rate as, or our used car verdict, good bet. That's, what, that's right. if you look yeah. at all of our used car ratings. But I also, you got to give them credit for, <laughs> for being the positivity yeah. of, of keeping the, the German car for 15 to 20 <laughs> years. Yeah. And not only that, <laughs> if it, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, whether, whether it lasts that long or not, uh, you're, it's going to be more expensive to uh, maintain and repair than a lot of other cars, like Japanese cars, especially, you know, because it just costs more. I mean, I, had, I kept my 96 Audi A4 for 14 years and then sold it and it lasts another five years and then the guy blew the engine somehow. Um, you know, but you have to have a good personal mechanic. You're going to have higher hourly rates than yeah. some, some yes. competing, like, you know, the Japanese you guys spe- specializing in, in cars from Japan or Korea. Um, I, I did some reliability stuff, Q5 above average, Mercedes-Benz above average, the Audi A4 S4 is, is more average than, than the others. The X6, based on the X5, oof, those years do not run. Run from the 11 to 13 you want to X5. Skip that. You want to skip we, that we, we've probably all been asked about buying high-end German cars. Yeah. And, and to me, the red flags are always, when it's out of warranty, you've got to make a commitment to this, and by commitment, I mean a financial, financial commitment, commitment to keep <laughs> right. it going. Uh, you know, to answer this person's question, I really, <laughs> I really wouldn't choose any of them. Uh, Consumer Reports. Uh, we, we just published an article called uh, "10 Cars Proven to Get to 200,000 Miles and Beyond," and I have to say, there wasn't one German car on the list. Yeah. So um, I, we wish you well. We wish you good luck. Um, but. Uh, this is a commitment. I'm not sure I would be willing they to might, make. They might be on the list of get to 200,000 miles and beyond for $200,000 or less. Um, <laughs> but so we're going to we're so, going to so mean. Final question here. <laughs> special one for these two guys. Quincy and Monticello have an interesting relationship. I can't tell if they're best friends or if they despise each other. Well, um, Monty, your dream last no. night about the Toyota Supra that Mike is Quincy has been this is considering. Really, he's been thinking about buying idea. a second-gen Supra for a long time, and, and I had a dream about it. We didn't need to go into it, but 
I, I think it's just funny that the person noticed this, first of all. Uh, and, and, and also, Quincy has a, a like wall of shame or fame on his cubicle <laughs> where he posts things, sayings around the office that are really funny. And as soon as he saw this comment, he printed it out and put it up on, it, he put it up on his cubicle because he, thought it, he couldn't stop laughing because he thought it was so funny. Yeah, we, we, we'd sit near each other. So, so all we, day, too we're going back and forth so, and back and so forth. So insider back. information, if you want to know, <laughs> uh, our cubicles are diagonal from each other. And so a couple times a day, uh, we, we discuss stuff. You know, we get up, look over our cubicles, mm -hmm. and, and we're talking about work stuff. We're talking about uh, life stuff. But, you know, all is not perfect. For instance, Quincy, <laughs> Quincy doesn't share my love of country music. No, <clears throat> none of us do. No, 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 no. Okay, that's hurtful. <laughs> and second, people may not know, whoops, hit the mic, uh, that uh, John and I have some, you know, we kind of have uh, uh, some common interests as well. We both uh, ride bicycles together a lot. We do a lot of group rides after work. And usually a couple times a year, we do uh, like a lunch ride. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be made fun of by your coworkers, dress up in full spandex uh, in the middle of the day, and then you will <laughs> never hear the end of it from don't, them. Don't hint to the May episodes. Okay? Uh, no, no, okay, no, 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 there no. might be a few trips. And, and super executive producer Dave Abrams makes fun of everything we wear anyway, so it really doesn't matter. I'm, I'm also it. a cyclist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just Mr. I, Normcore over I, here. I can't keep up with these guys and their bikes. They're they're. Younger and faster than me. Well, but, spring is know. in the air, and uh, you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll get to all that. But, but later. for the record, Mike's a great guy. Okay. That's going to wrap it up on this episode of Talking Cars with Consumer <laughs> Reports. Um, as you saw on the top of the show, you can join us for a live taping of Talking Cars with Consumer Reports next Thursday at the New York International Auto Show. Send an email to talkingcars at consumer.org so you can get more information. As always, you can check the show notes below for more information on what we talked about in this episode. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.